for gas refrigeration. How frequently is this used? It's infrequently used, okay? But it's not never used. It is used in some applications. Here's a problem. We threw some numbers out. We had a pressure ratio of four. True. We were able to get very low temperatures uh, down in this vicinity, negative 60, negative 45 degrees C, accounting for some isentropic of coefficiency of the compressor and turbine. Okay. Notice the coefficient of performance is not outstanding for a gas refrigeration cycle. It's a low. And then I left you, or we finished with this question last time, right? Say we take out the turbine and we put in an expansion valve. How's the system going to work? It's not going to work, right? And why? Because if it's truly an ideal gas, and we know this is isenthalpic process, then for a true ideal gas, isenthalpic expansion through an expansion valve gives me isothermal. <laughs> T3 is equal to T4. T4 is not low. I can't pick up heat in that heat exchanger. Where do we find some of this or reverse Brayton cycle refrigeration? In the natural gas industry. So I think a lot of you are interested in learning what engineers really do, especially in coming out of a class like this in thermodynamics. There's not one job uh, posting that says I want to hire a mechanical engineer thermodynamicist. They don't exist. You take thermodynamics, you take fluid mechanics, you take heat transfer, and typically those are building blocks into particular areas. One of those areas I'm going to talk about now. So in the new San Antonio Business Journal, a company, Hayco, will invest $91 million and build a plant to convert Eagle Ford gas to alternative fuel. So this was recently done in May, and it's out of a da Dallas-based company with Dallas Money is investing in this, almost $100 million to build a plant east of San Antonio. So here's San Antonio, and I figured out it's going to be built between Yoakum and Hallettsville on that highway somewhere, probably close to closer to Hallettsville, but I'm not exactly sure. And uh, what they're going to do is produce liquefied natural gas, or LNG. And why are they going to produce it? Well, first of all, there's an abundance of natural gas in that area. That's part of the Eagle Ford Shale. And then why would they produce it there? Because they're going to consume it there. And who's going to consume it? They're going to be consumed by operators in the Eagle Ford Shale who are heavy energy users. Okay. we read a little more. So they're going to break ground in May or June, which means they already did. And they're going to take and convert natural gas extracted from the shale and make LNG, liquefied natural gas. And it's going to be used primarily, here's key, fuel rigs, the fuel, the drilling rigs, and the hydraulic fracturing equipment. So they bring all this equipment out. How fast can they drill a hole now? How? 10 days? It's incredible. 20 days for sure. They can, and all that energy associated with drilling. And then fracking, it takes a lot of energy, but they're on the site and they're out. So they consume a lot of energy. This is a picture of what that rig is going to do. They're going to back up a fuel tank. And that fuel tank is going to be at the site where there's a whole bunch of hungry engines. And that LNG mobile regasification trailer will supply. Um, look at that 15,000 gallon LNG trailer. They could probably pull one off. It is integrated with the vaporization and flow control and offloading pumps, and it's all ruggedized and uh, designed for extreme South Texas summer environments, plus the workers out there that are pretty extreme too, right, have already converted a lot of these pieces of equipment that they can, they're dual fuel, that typically burn diesel right now, but they'll switch over. And why? Well, because it's cheap. So if you don't know anything about liquefied natural gas, you could go and take a look at it. What is this interesting number, negative 256 degrees F at atmospheric pressure? Natural gas usually doesn't want to be in the liquid form. You have to get it very, very cold, cryogenic temperatures to get it that 
to turn it into a liquid at atmospheric pressure. Now those trailers are probably at about 100 to 150 PSI, so it's not as cold as that, but typically it has to be much, much, much lower than 25 degrees C or 77 degrees F. Why do they do it? There's a couple reasons. There's a lot of uses of LNG, but typically if you wanted to move uh, natural gas from one place to another, typically where it's produced or brought out of the ground to where it's consumed, you have to have a pipeline, and pipelines are extremely efficient. But sometimes it's hard to put a pipeline. So for the last you know, 25 years or so, they've been building ships, which are mobile pipelines, to take and transport LNG or natural gas across oceans. So you'd produce it in Kuwait, refrigerate it, load it to a ship, take it to Japan, take it to Europe, take it to the United States, and then unload it. And why do they liquefy it? Because there's a 600 to 1 volume ratio. It's huge, you, so you really pack it in, but you have to make it cold and keep it cold to pack it in. So the one ship can carry a lot. So uh, that's primarily been the use of LNG when you can't build a pipeline you liquefy, transport, and then unliquefy. Then stick it into a pipeline right there where you, un where you, where you need it. Uh, what is natural gas? Methane, just think methane. It's 98% methane, all right? So there's a lot that you can read about LNG and natural gas. This is more on that article that I grabbed from and talk about where it's located, Highway 77, Lavaca County, and one of the busiest swaths of the Eagle Ford Shale. And what's very interesting, this is a LNG plant not next to the coast, and it's right located where they're going to consume it. They're not going to, they're going to produce it and then truck it in the vicinity, that county, Gonzales County, DeWitt County, um, all those counties that are uh, that consuming this energy. All right, let's jump to this one. So this company, H-U-I-C-O, uh, out of Dallas, we need more of these companies out of San Antonio, not out of Houston and Dallas, right? Um, this is the, the kind of a footprint or picture of the plant. They're not trivial. They're highly engineered. Once you have them engineered and built, then you just need a few smart people to continue to run them. But it's going to produce. They're going to tap into a local pipeline. They're going to pull that gas off. Then they're going to refrigerate it and make it liquid, low, low temperatures, store it, ship it, and use it. Okay. What's also interesting was this company, H-E-Y-C-O, will employ the cryopack PCMR pre-cooling mixed refrigerant process with equipment from SALOF Refrigeration. Okay, so I thought, hmm, where's that company located? That company is located in Schertz, Texas. Schertz, Texas. And uh, this company now has been bought out by GE. So if you want to talk to them, you're going to have to talk to GE. Yeah, but GE is like huge. This was just a little company in, right off of 35, just in the outskirts of San Antonio. But they've been designing and building small-scale LNG equipment there and, and shipping it and producing it and putting it all over the world. Anywhere where you have the source, but you don't have easy transportation. That's typically been the, 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 um, where they would use the LNG. Not exclusively, but typically. So you, if you have an island and you have a natural gas production on it, or an oil rig in the middle of water and you have production, but you don't want to do a pipeline, you can then produce it and then ship it off in trucks or barges or ocean-going vessels. So um, this company is the one that actually uh, has the engineers and all the technicians and the welders to make this work. Let's jump back here. So there you go. There's another company, Stabilis Energy, uh, who is going to uh, produce a new liquefied natural gas, another LNG plant. 
What are they, what's the purpose? To fuel the high horsepower fracking and drilling engines. So they pull that semi out, hook it up, and forget the diesel tanks. Now you have a tank of LNG. And they can retrofit and have retrofit a lot of the engines there. But um, it's primarily the cost savings. Uh, that one plant they're going to build is in George West, Texas. So it's right, I think this is an image of that little dot. Is that where George West, Texas is? Who's been down there? Nobody? It's not a big place, but it's in the middle of the Eagle Ford Shale. But look how many gallons per day they're going to have the capacity for. That's quite a few gallons, 100,000 gallons of LNG a day. All right. And again, it's ab America's abundant, low-cost natural gas and the need for fracking, high energy use and drilling and fracking. Okay. Here's another news article. So a new LNG terminal, now that's to receive or ship, okay, will export the Eagle Ford Shale natural gas abroad, outside of Texas, outside of the U.S. So notice how they start this. They say customers in Louisiana pay around $2.40 for MMBTU. The MM is 1,000 times 1,000, so it's a million. BTUs energy content. So you sell it in energy content. So if somebody has a lot of nitrogen in it, well, they're supposed to clean it up, but they don't get as much money as if it has low nitrogen content. Because you can't combust nitrogen, right? You combust the, the, the energy is from the methane. While if you can get it to Tokyo, look at that. That's a, that's a big price difference. So you know, that's why they push it over oceans and stuff, load it up. So this terminal is going to load it onto vessels. They were building, 10 years ago, they were building terminals in the United States, in Texas, to receive LNG. And I'll talk about that. Now we're rapidly building terminals to export LNG. It's huge. And it's all, you have to refrigerate it to get it cold, to make it liquid. All right, so so there's a glut. I wouldn't say there's a glut. I mean, it, it's just that we can produce it, and now it's time to sell it where they want it. It will be constructed in three phases with work on the first liquefaction plant or train. What they do is they have little modules. They call them trains. I don't know that why they call them trains, but maybe this module can make, you know, 25,000 gallons a day, and this module another 25 and another 25. So the whole plant, you know, you can run it with two of them running, two trains running, or all of them running. But this is all happening first quarter of 2014. So it's going to be down in Corpus Christi area, and they're going to process a lot of natural gas per year. And what is the cost of this facility? Twelve billion dollars. That's 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 a lot of. Some people are investing there into this facility. So let's take a look. I think I have some stuff. This is talking about that. Yeah, that article. Here's a picture of the La Quintina, La Quinta, channel in northeast of Corpus Christi. Some people may have fished or driven by it. Okay. And uh, there's a big Alcoa plant, as I understand, right next door, and some other industries. And you can kind of see about what they have to do to get ready to liquefy. They've got to get it there, get, make, get, get any of the condensate, which means some higher uh, carbon hydrocarbons, like the propane, the ethane. They only want the methane. That's a CH4. Okay, not the C2s and the C3s and the C4s. Get all those out. Then you want to dehydrate. Get the water out. Then you want to get out the CO2, which could make acid in your pipelines and lead to corrosion. And you want to get out the sulfur, the hydrogen sulfides, H2, which is acidic and very uh, toxic, and any mercury. Now, as I understand the Eagle Ford gas, uh, like no hydrogen sulfides, great. Very, very low carbon dioxide, great. Low nitrogen, great. 
and high condensate in the form of like met ethane. Great, because that's more valuable to get the ethane out. You, you produce a lot, manufacture a lot with ethane. Anyway, then you jump into refrigeration to liquefy, store and handle it, and move it. I thought that was interesting. So this is the Calhoun LNG project, and that's where I grabbed this map from, or it's, it's showing you. So here's Port Lavaca. Here is this channel, Matagorda, Matagorda Ship Channel. And right there is Alcoa. And there's the proposed LNG terminal. Anybody? Sea Drift, Port O'Connor, anybody know those areas? No? Kind of off. Some, some, I see some people know them. But most of us, looks like, don't. Uh, you know, here's a picture of the proposed layout. In looking at the Alcoa plant, the ship channel, LNG terminal project, projected site. And let me see if there's one more here. Maybe it's this one. Oh, this is a cartoon kind of showing you the LNG storage tanks and then the vaporization, separation facility. And then um, big ships will come in there. As they said, I think I, two, two docking stations. And those ships usually have big white spherical balls to, to hold the LNG at higher pressure at that low temperature. Okay. So the other one is Freeport LNG. Now, Freeport's over by Houston, as I understand it. And I don't know exactly where it's at, somewhere in the Houston Ship Channel area. But this uh, f uh, terminal started out as an import. They basically finished it. <laughs> And then they quickly upgrade and expand for export because you have to, when you take it in, all you do is vaporize it and stick it back in the pipelines. That used to be the mode. But here you got to get it from the pipelines, liquefy, and then store it and ship it out. But this is an excellent website. If you're interested in coming up to speed on things, I would encourage you to check it out. Um, they just have a lot of information um, and pictures and even videos. I, I don't think I have time to show you these videos. They get a little long. Have you uh, seen the San Antonio Express News article that went out less than a month, I think, ago? And it was ranting, not ranting, but basically calling into question the health effects of those living in the Eagle Ford Shale from the gas, from the emissions. And so the flare gas is typically considered wasteful and polluting. Have you seen anything like this? No? All right. Too busy studying? Yes. Yeah, too busy studying. Well, there's a huge amount of natural gas, which is, uh, if you're just going to flare it off, you don't make any money off of it. And I mean a lot of cubic feet. And you can see it from satellite images. Uh, you can see areas of where there's drilling activity from all the light uh, coming out. Well, one of the strategies to handle this flare gas is to do something with it, right? You could, and there are companies, I didn't put more on this, who are fabricating, designing, and fab uh, um, refrigeration units that can go out to the site, set it off, pull it in, clean it up, refrigerate it, put it into a tanker. And then the semi you know, drivers pick it up every couple of days when it's full. And then when you stop the flaring and you have another pipeline hooked up, then you can pull that mobile rig and take take it to the next place. You're not supposed to flare for what 30 days. I think then you have to get an extra permit. It's a, supposed to be a temporary thing, not a permanent thing. So this is easy to say, but it's hard to build, especially to package it. So it's mobile, can go on a semi and then off the semi, set up, hook it up, and get working. All right. How do they do this um, liqu liquefaction? Well, take a look at this article. Nitrogen expansion cycle. That's how they, one of the methods for doing it, nitrogen expansion. Hey, we studied thermodynamics. We studied refrigeration. What is this like? Well, you can read more about it 
but right down here, the the mixed refrigeration refrigerant cycles they dominate the medium and large scale LNG plants. The reverse Brighton nitrogen cycle or N2 expansion cycle has enjoyed a resurgence at small scale LNG plants. That's just what we studied. We just finished studying this, right? So uh, what, what type of cycles do they have for the medium and large scale plants and what type, what does this reverse Brayton cycle look like? And they talk about different technologies used to liquefy the natural gas. And the cascade, that's one of those that we studied, cascade refrigeration cycles. And that this is the, the MR, which you have the multiple refrigerants. It's a mixture. It's a mixture, not just one, uh, let's say, pure R134A or, or pure nitrogen. The specific power for different liquefaction processes. Uh, you want, let's see, this is how many kilowatt hours, assuming you have electricity to run the plant, per metric ton of LNG produced. It looks like you'd be better if you had a lower number than a higher number. And so here is the nitrogen expansion, reverse Brayton. And here is something over here. What is C3 slash MR? All these are little acronyms, so that's packaged and quickly communicated. But so what is a CH4 methane? And then if you have C3H8, what is that? It's propane. And, and so anyway, this is a propane pre-cooler with a mixed refrigerant um, blend for the deep cooling. All right. Then the cascade, then the single mixed refrigerant, and et cetera. Here is a schematic of a single mixed refrigerant plant, and this is very high level. Do I have time to get into it? No. No, no. I have to break it down, simplify, break it down, simplify, right? Here is natural gas feed, and here is LNG to the plant. So inside this black box, or this box right here, you know, you, you feed in natural gas and you get out LNG. <laughs> you also can get NGLs. What? Did they typo? Is that LNG or is that NGL? This actually is a bigger dollar sign right now. Natural gas liquids are very valuable. And oh, that is uh, very high for the, this shale play here in Texas. All right, another piece of thing I'll just point out is a cold box. Well, this is the shape of the box, and uh, what do you think the temperature is inside that box? Cold. All right, and we know that it's super cold with the LNG coming out, so somehow down here it's got to be really cold. All right, well coming in it's not cold. It's 77 degrees F whatever you get out of the pipeline. There's a gradation in temperature from warm, colder, 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 to, and it's all about heat transfer. It's taking heat transfer, right? You're going to take it, right? It's a required class. It's a really important class. And so you have heat exchangers, and you typically want to do it in counterflow for efficiency. Counterflow heat exchangers. So what you have is fluid streams that are let's say this one right here for natural gas coming in fairly warm and then you have another counter flowing fluid stream which is transferring heat to it across it they're not going to show you all the details it's just inside that cold box and a lot of people specialize in just designing the cold box and they sell it to different people where you can hook it up with different connections all right well you get some natural gas you cool it off somewhat then you put it in here and you flash it, you fractionate it off the top, you grab the vapor, the vapor comes along and you cool it some more and finally it condenses and you sell LNG. But the liquids come off, they're the natural gas liquids, you warm it back up to warm it up some and then you can supply the natural gas liquids there. Uh, you can use the some of this cold, cold LNG to keep this 
column cold. There's a lot of things in here. I need to skip this because I don't know how much you're going to get off of it. But here's some compressors, some cooling condensers. Uh, yeah, liquid separator. So you're separating off. You'll come in, you'll flash, okay, and you'll draw off the top, the vapor. You'll draw off the bottom, the liquid. Okay? Yeah. Here's a simpler system because this one is just the nitrogen expansion. It's just the reverse Brayton. But from the gas processing news, it doesn't look as simple as the diagram we study, does it? But I think it's more understandable. They still have the cold box. They still have natural gas feed in, and they still have the LNG cold going out to the tank. So here is the nitrogen coming in here. Let's, let's kind of go here. Let's take a look here. What is this coming in right there? If this is the coldest of the cold coming out, and I need to, right here, I need to cool it off, cool it off, right? This stream coming out, cool it off, cool it off. It, wouldn't this be the coldest of the cold coming in? It would be. So is this side, the left side, is that the expander or the compressor side? The fluid comes through here, and I want to get it super cold, the coldest that the nitrogen is going to get in this loop. So is this the expander or the compressor? It's the expander. It's the turbine. Yeah. So it's going to drop the temperature. Go back to our Brayton cycle, right? Through that turbine. Here they're calling it expander. I'm just trying to increase your vocabulary, not try to confuse you. Then... Uh, what happens is, is as you're coming through here, you're getting warmer, 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 warmer. Now you come out, and you're ready to go through a compressor. Now that, they don't show a, it hooked up to an expander compressor. It's going to be running uh, and consuming energy from somewhere, shaft power from electric motor. Then it's really hot. What do you do? Cool it off with water. Then what do you do? You're compressing it. You cool it off with water because it was made hotter when you compress it. It's hotter. Then it's a high pressure. You compress again. Now it's really high pressure. You cool it again, so it's compressed, cooled, compressed, cooled, compressed, cooled. Then you can come back and start coming in here to cool, but also it'll come across It'll have some cooling, but what will happen right here? This expander will make it cooler. And then you can bring that in for some cooling. Um, this one comes over, goes to an expander, makes it real cold. They come in. There you go. You kind of see the refrigerant loop. It's not that simple, is it? But I tried to pick one of the simplest schematics that I could for these plants and show it to you. Here's one simpler one from Air Products, but it's really, ah, I tried to add a little here. So here's a gas feed, and they have a knockout drum. What does that do? Well, there's some liquids that you want to get. They're too heavy. You don't really, you want to liquefy the methane. The propane and ethane, either you capture it, put it out, or you just say, we don't want you. Get the liquid, revolatize it, and put it back out somewhere push it back somewhere else I can't handle you all I want is the methane so now that I've drawn off the vapor which is methane it's been cooled some of this natural gas has been cooled right and then it's been flashed to knock out the liquids then you finish the cooling and voila you've got liquid nitrogen uh, natural gas I don't know why I'm so tongue twisted maybe the nitrogen loop looks easier does it All right, so you come out, you compress, you cool it, you compress, you cool it, you start cooling, and then you expand, and now you're ready for real cooling. Here is an even simpler diagram. You have to simplify the real system. Let's assume something about the inlet gas feed. What temperature and pressure do you, would you just like to pick for that inlet gas feed? Let's put uh, 25 degrees C, 
And because I don't see a pump through this heat exchanger, it's just going to be some pressure, but it's going to be ideal gas or vapor. It's natural gas, and it's pure methane. So it's all CH4, okay? So it's methane, 25C. Let's just say it's 100 kPa. We know definitely it's in the vapor state at that condition. And now it's going to come out 100 kPa, one atmosphere pressure. I know it's typically going to be higher, but I had to pick something. Now, we want that to come out liquid, liquid natural gas, liquid methane. What temperature do I need? Yeah, it needs to be below 160 something. So let's pick it out at negative 170 degrees C. You go to your books and you say, well, or a computer program, you say, what is the enthalpy of the methane coming in at 25C and 100 kPa? And you just get a number for it. It's around 910 kilojoules per kilogram. I don't think our book has it, but there's software packages. And did I show you RefProp? That's the one I used. Now, I do have some videos how to download it and then install it and interrogate. And, I, um, and then the enthalpy at negative 170 at 100 kPa is a whopping negative 30 kilojoules per kilogram. So the change in enthalpy is 940 uh, kilojoules per kilogram. It's about a thousand kilojoules per kilogram. Make sense? So it takes about that much energy that has to be removed. Now, when you deal with heat transfer, you'll know that this temperature, if I'm going to move a little bit of heat, little move uh, through the system, that this fluid stream here would always have to be a uh, higher temperature, and this nitrogen would always have to be lower temperature. That's not trivial. You need to investigate that as an engineer to make sure the system will work. But we're going to assume, okay, it works. What do, you, what do you think the temperature is that I need for the nitrogen to come in for this thing to work? It needs to be less than 170. Let's say it comes in at negative 180 degrees C, right? And we're going to be starting to cool it. So what temperature do you think the nitrogen could come out at? 15, yeah, 15 degrees C. So a delta T, and I know that this is probably going to violate inside this heat exchanger some second law because once it starts to go through a phase change, right, then I have a flat spot there, and I remove a lot of heat at the same temperature. So don't think that that delta T is going to be a uniform 10 degrees C throughout that heat exchanger. It's not. All right. If I want that to happen, and I have this combined expander compressor, this is the compressor, this is my expander. Notice that it's kind of visually connected with a shaft, but there's going to be some network supplied, right? What is the mass flow rate that I need to have for the nitrogen to go through that loop? If I have a mass flow rate of, of the methane, to be one kilogram per second. I want to do everything on one kilogram of methane basis. So I just say, okay, I'm going to pick one kilogram per second of methane through the system. What's my mass flow rate of nitrogen going to be? How would I find it? For the cold box. For the cold box. Do an energy balance around the cold box, right? Wouldn't it be that mass flow rate of the nitrogen times the change in enthalpy of the nitrogen, maybe just go with constant specific heat of the nitrogen, times the increase in temperature from the inlet to the outlet. So what is that? That's going to be uh, temperature on the outlet, exit minus temperature in the inlet for the nitrogen, equal to mass flow rate of the methane, CH4, times a change in enthalpy, enthalpy in minus enthalpy exit of the nitrogen, uh, not nitrogen, methane, CH4. That equation makes sense? So you can get that. Okay, what is a specific heat nitrogen, roughly? I know it's low temperature, but just give me a value of specific heat for nitrogen in the ballpark. 
one kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin. What was this temperature change? Well, 195. You could round off to 200, right? And so you could see then the relative uh, change. So the um, you're going to have the mass flow rate of the methane, CH4, times 940 divided by roughly 200. 1,000 divided by 200, five times. See that? So if I'm trying to uh, produce one kilogram per second of the LNG, I'm going to need five times that mass flow rate of the nitrogen in this simplified diagram. What is my pressure ratio that I need across that expander? Uh, you, let's just pick the nitrogen to be 100 kPa here. Okay, What's it coming out at, 100 kPa? Because it's just a heat exchanger. Now, what is the pressure that the, goes into the expander? Or what is the pressure increase across the compressor? See what I'm asking? I, I picked a value for this pressure here, let's say 100. I could have picked 200. But what is, what is the pressure inlet to the expander, which is the same as the pressure outlet of the compressor? What's the equation that we might use having studied thermodynamics Nitrogen's an ideal gas. It's going through either a compressor on one side or a turbine or expander on the other. I'm going to assume it's a great compressor, a great turbine, a great expander, isentropic, right? So what's the equation? What, what's the relationship? That's it. So basically you can remember it like, uh, let's do this one. Here's uh, here T2 over T1 is equal to P2 over P1 to the K minus 1 over K. Does that look familiar? Say this is um, state 1, this is state 2. Okay, so T2 is going to be low. T2 needs to be negative 180 degrees C, 273. What is that in Kelvin? 93, 93 Kelvin. So this is 93 Kelvin, right? Okay. Oh, this pressure P2 is 100 kPa. What does P1 have to be? It depends on what T1 is. Okay, look at this, what I have. I'm cooling it with air. What's the lowest T1 reasonable? T1. Back to outside air. Maybe 10 degrees hotter than outside air. Something like that, right? So let's say it's outside air, 298 Kelvin, right? So we fixed 298 right there. So now I can calculate if I have K of about 1.4. I know it's not 1.4, but it's close enough. This gives us in the ballpark. So guess what P, um, P1 is? How many times greater than P2 it is? How many times? Can somebody run that calculator quick? How many times greater? I know I'm running out of time. We wanted to go further, but what'd you get? Almost 6,000. 6,000? It's almost like 100, 300 equal to this ratio of P's, P2 over P1, and then you have the 1 minus 4.4 divided by 1.4, right? So get that ratio of pressures. Yeah, you did it right. What you got was P2 over P1 is like a 1 over 60, so that uh, P1 is 60 times uh, P2, and P2 we said was 100, so it's 6,000 6, kPa. Is that a reasonable pressure? So now you know what the compressor has to do. So what's the temperature coming out of here? A lot. Then you have to cool it off, throw away a lot of energy. So we could do a better job. I'm sorry, I'm out of time. We could finish this analysis. But it starts to give you a sense of the real refrigeration calculations needed. Thank you.